the area because the 35 millimeter format has uh, four sprockets per frame. Uh, so there's no way to position the uh, the LED um, time code in between the sprockets like we can on the 16 millimeter right, views. Right. So so if you looked at the the 16 millimeter, you could actually see the the sprockets at the top and the bottom of of each frame, and those aren't visible in, in the 35 as you see here. The uh, the camera number uh, is on the lower right hand uh, on the lower right hand display of the LED time code, and it's uh, in this case it's camera number 62. So the uh, the 35 millimeter format also allows us to put a, a, de a camera designator number that's uh, fairly often used uh, just to help for uh, viewing purposes and, and tracking purposes. This again is a 105 millimeter lens um, and is on the pad perimeter, approximately 1,270 feet uh, from the uh, from the vehicle. Look at look at the the. Uh... The, the absolute force that all of this stuff is coming out of there. I, I've talked uh, earlier in the piece about how much is coming out of the solid rocket boosters, 20,000 pounds uh, combined, and then the uh, SSMEs are losing 3,000 pounds of uh, liquid propellants a second. And that really shows up here when you're looking underneath the, the launch platform. You can see uh, that all of that stuff doesn't have anywhere to go, which is why it's vectored out on both sides uh, so it can be um, sort of safely directed away from the vehicle so there's no uh, rebounding or or a sort of backflow so to speak. And one thing we haven't had a chance to talk about uh, earlier is the uh, how the cameras are triggered. Uh, currently the, um, the cameras all triggered using the uh, POX or the photo optical control system which triggers all the cameras on the pad perimeter on the uh, fixed service structure as well as the, uh, the MLP and uh, it's quite a sophisticated system um, to synchronize and, and trigger all the cameras uh, based on the launch clock. Yeah, it's undoubtedly uh, a very complex system to have all these cameras operate uh, flawlessly for each launch. They're very important, if not critical, for, for shuttle launches and um, it's an amazing achievement that uh, all the men and women who, who work on this are able to uh, do it uh, with such a degree of reliability every launch. Um, another shot here is, as I said, moving around counterclockwise, you see the SSMEs or the boosters are just firing, excuse me, and there you see the, the gut falling back as we talked about earlier, the uh, umbilical uh, assembly. This view is using the same 105 millimeter focal length uh, lens that the, uh, the other two views we just uh, looked at, and again is about 1200 feet from the, uh, from the vehicles where the camera site is located. You know, th this was a really unusual day because you just mentioned earlier that, you know, from not all, from all views is the lighting going to be as good, but this is about as good as it gets. I mean, each and every one of these camera views is well exposed, uh, both from an engineering and a beauty standpoint. Uh, they're all very, very nice shots. And it's why we selected 124 uh, to be the predominant content in this movie. There's the, uh, the uh, water tower, by the way, in the foreground. It's just about to get engulfed with the exhaust. This is a DOG 68. It's a 35 millimeter camera and it's really uh, uh, intended to be a documentary camera. So it's running at uh, 28 uh, frames per second, uh, not really a high speed camera. So it's, it's almost real time, a real time camera view. It's a, just a really beautiful shot. and. Uh, because it's a documentary camera, we're able to uh, uh, enlarge the aperture so that the timing block isn't taking up image area and present it in its uh, widescreen view, and I think it's quite dramatic. Yeah, from a, from a beauty standpoint, um, this is probably at the top of my list for favorites. Uh, um, it's just gorgeous quality, uh, fantastic color saturation, and um, very unusual for uh, shuttle photography to be so beautiful uh, at the same time. So Echo 55 begins our series of uh, tracking cameras. Um, Echo 55 is mounted on a Kineto tracking mount, or KTM, which we uh, commonly refer to it as, and it's uh, located at CS1, about 1,200 feet uh, from the vehicle. This is a nice shot because you can see uh, there's a bit of a distortion cloud here that we're shooting through, and what that is is hydrogen being burned off um, from the fueling system. They, they burn off any excess hydrogen 
uh, to safely combust it. And so that's what we're seeing here, and it's really gorgeous as the vehicle sort of comes out of that and goes into its roll program, uh, clearing the tower. Uh, again, just a fantastically uh, well-lit photograph on this on this day. Some of the white things that you see falling off there are paper covers, which protect some of the uh, order maneuvering system engines. We'll talk about those later. But Kevin, the, the, these are all manually operated, right? I mean, there are human beings behind the scenes um, doing this tracking now. Yes, this uh, uh, KTM, or the Canad Oak Tracking Mount, has about four cameras that, that are mounted on it. And this particular uh, camera, Echo 55, is one of a pair of cameras um, and is intended to look at the uh, top half of the vehicle, while the other camera is intended to look at the bottom portion of the vehicle. Right, and we'll see that in the next shot. We'll have one of the, uh, one of the v views from the uh, bottom of the stack on the next one. In fact, our intent is uh, to have in the deleted scenes on this disc um, uh, a set of camera pair of views sort of pieced together so you can see them simultaneously. So look for that in the extra features. This is, this is a, a fantastic. Now they're completely uh, done with their roll program and uh, sort of on their way. Yeah, the, uh, the intent of that uh, camera shot is only for the first 1,200 feet uh, of the ascent is uh, really the, uh, the, the intention of that, uh, that view, and that takes about uh, 18 to 20 seconds, I believe. Okay, now this is camera 52, and this, is, of course, is at the bottom of the stack now, so it's a little different view, and, uh, but part of a camera pair again. Right. This, is, this camera is, uh, as you said, is 52, and this is located on uh, camera site uh, 2 and is about the same distance, uh, 1,200 feet, uh, 1,270 feet from the vehicle. Nice shot of the SSMEs there. It, it always amazes me how transparent the exhaust coming out of the SSMEs is. Now this uh, Kinetto tracking mount is, uh, is controlled by an operator, manually controlled by an operator uh, who's sitting in the LCC on the second floor uh, below the firing room. And uh, the person, he or she, is using a, a trackball to uh, track um, the, the vehicle. And it's, uh, it's pretty tricky because they're just looking at a little video monitor. And uh, the vehicle is moving much faster in real time than we're seeing. We're seeing it at, uh, you know, one-fifth the speed in this particular case of uh, what it is in real time. Uh, this Kinetto tracking mount also has uh, HDTV cameras that are uh, mounted that are used for what we'll call quick look, what's called quick look. Uh, to look at the uh, these views in real time and then in near real time uh, you know, when they start the uh, image analysis. Uh, this is done while the film is getting processed and uh, transferred. That was a, a fantastic shot um, seeing the sun go right in between the two plumes and in fact it gives you an idea how bright these plumes are to the naked eye because uh, the sun as it passed through there wasn't much brighter than, than, than the plumes that you saw. Wonderful shot showing the column of fire that the vehicle rises on, and it, it really contrasts nicely with the blue. Again, highlighting why STS-124 was, was really the correct mission to, to sort of springboard off of to show all the beautiful film.